So we are at the Palazzo Pino Pascali in Polignano, Italy, and um, just by pure coincidence, um, Chris Bennett is here uh, doing some research for his uh, dissertation for his PhD on Pino Pascali, and uh, and he knows a great deal about this artist, and and I've I learned a lot just at lunch. I'm sitting talking to you that I didn't I didn't know before, so he's just going to tell us a little bit about, about the artist. Mm -hmm. What what should we talk about first? Let's talk about the scenography and set design. His background in that, I guess, it's mm -hmm. very influential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I was telling you earlier, um, he finished his degree in La Scenografia, or set design, in 1959 in Rome, and. Uh, had his first exhibition in 65, um, January 1965. So there's a, a gap in between when he was working with um, RAI, the TV station. Um, but it's certainly the case that this pragmatic training and set design that we talked about helped him churn out so many works of art between 1965 and 1968 when he died. And, um, with the earlier works shown in 1965, like the ruins on the grass, for example, it still looks rather close to a, a prop or, you know, an actual piece of well, sense. Yeah. yeah. I, when you said that at lunch, I immediately thought, because he made this out of canvas and, and yeah. wood, you know, and I thought that's such a, that's such a set making yeah. trick of the trade. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, some people, when they talk about these, they also talk about pulley and boat making techniques. Right. Uh, yeah. And that technology having yeah. an impact on it. It doesn't match the two. I mean, mm -hmm. it is, yes, it's, it's that. Perhaps it's the area and that tradition and set making, and then, and can, it's, but it's contemporary art, so it's all kind of meshed into one thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, what else? What is something that you think is particularly interesting about? about Pascali in general. Um, well, I mean, just going back to the issue of set design, I think, uh, you know, Visconti, the filmmaker, mm -hmm. when he made his film, White Nights, um, he was describing uh, to his cameraman how he wanted the film to look. Mm -hmm. And um, he was talking about this, the use of props and so forth, and he said, um, I want the, the film to look absolutely true which means that it should also look slightly fake. Right. And there's this play on words. And um, I've always very much admired uh, Pascali's experimentation with ambiguity and how it, this pragmatic training in set design gives him this ability to produce something that's at once veristic and you know, very pragmatically constructed mm -hmm. and convincing mm -hmm. as a mimetic representation, but also self really it's self-consciously fictional and really shows how it was made. Mm -hmm. So you get this double doubleness mm -hmm. to where um, it's a very strong medical representation, but you can also tell that it's fake. Right. And that ambiguity is really interesting to me. Somehow it's, it's more true uh, mm -hmm. than a one-dimensional use of natural materials, mm -hmm. of like, this is nature as such, mm -hmm. you know. Or even the other extreme, which is just to take an industrial ready-made and, and that involves no further fabrication. Mm -hmm. it, it somehow has this oscillation between these things like yeah. uh, nature, artifice, um, industry, artisanal production, yeah. and um, his ability to sort of explode oppositions and contraries and have them interact mm -hmm. is really phenomenal. Yeah. And, um, so he has a dialectical awareness, really, which Visconti also had. Um, of course, Visconti was explicitly a member of the Communist Party. Um, and as far as I know, Pascali did not make his political affiliations quite so transparent. Mm -hmm. uh, that the doubleness is something that I very much admire. And I, that's one reason he's, I think, has a real contemporary edge you know, these days with people like Maurizio Catalan and, yeah. um, who knows um, Torres, Felix Torres and, yeah. Yeah. yeah and the intensity of the project 
What are the this, this series that we talked about earlier, the water and the, the, the dye he used? What is, mm. is the, did he do a series of those, or was it just sort of one-off pieces? Yeah. Um, well, he was he did this exhibition of well, the sequence of exhibitions is uh, 1965 um, at the Tartaruga, the Total Gallery in Rome. He does shaped canvases of women's bodies. Yeah. And then he signs a contract uh, with Fabio Sargentini and does Nuove Sculture, the new sculptures, which are animals shown in the garden. Um, and then it was in June 1967 for a show called Fire, Earth, Air, Water that he first exhibited these works with water. And um, shortly before, Pascali had traveled with Fabio Sargentini to Germany to show some of his work there, and in conversation with Udu Koltumann, this critic, the critic told him about Bruce Nauman's work with water. So Pascali experienced a spark, this is what Sargentini told me, and um, came back to Rome and right around June 67, uh, started to make these works with water. And the first ones were um, puddles. Um, it's like um, quick drying cement with little divots cut out and then they're shown in wooden frames on the floor directly, and Pascali filled up the divots with tap water. And um, then it was slightly later, in late 67, early 68, that he actually did the 32 cubic meters of sea, a really big sea. I love that. Yeah. Uh, but it's, they're the hilarious photographs of him standing, holding a hose, filling up the pans, and yeah. just tap water. And then they go through and put he sprinkles aniline dye in the water and varies the amount of dye in each one, so you get, you know, kind of a heterogeneous radiant. surface. Yeah, radiant surface. And when he first showed that one, the 32 cubic meters at Latico in Rome, it was stuffed into this tiny space. And um, there's another interesting thing about that one is there's a little, like, lightning bolt shaped zigzag in the pans that you can walk through. And in the photographs, he's kind of walking through them, balancing himself. Yeah. Um, but those works initially were interpreted, were very important for the, the formation of this idea of arte povera, which the critics, they developed it in response to that work with soil, work with water, and in Cunellis' case, work with fire. And the use of natural materials became a real engine for this idea of a of an impoverished materiality that is kind of a, a poetics of uh, raw materials. And what I was describing before about the ambiguity in his work, um, that's sort of my interest. Uh, but at the time, in 67, when he first showed the water, it was often interpreted as uh, a much more idealistic, kind of pure uh, positing of water as such. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of romance of natural material. Pascali's work is so, it's so obviously fake, so obviously industrial, that one of the major critical responses was largely to ignore the artificial aspect um, and focus just on the natural aspect. Um, but this happens within the critical field. You know, critics take a part of the work and formulate a tidy definition of what's going on. But I think for contemporary audiences, like these uh, bristle worms made from industrial steel wool brushes, you know, or bridge made from steel wool, the, the degree of the artifice is really important, mm -hmm. like for making it evocative. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if, you've, if you come across it yet, but it's the quote you find in all the Piscata literature, but he has this great line where he says, in order to, to feel like a sculptor, I have to make fake sculptures. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just a brilliant formulation. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, in Italy in the 60s, I mean, Alighiero Boetti is in Perspex. Uh, he showed a wall of Perspex in 66, 67 at the Galleria Sperone. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got Anselmo using lettuce. Mm -hmm. And then you've got uh, 67, soil, fire, and water. And then in 69, there's Canellis' very famous proposition of horses in the gallery. And uh, 
as far as I know, the very first exhibition of a live animal in Italy was by Richard Serra, the American artist. He showed some live bunny rabbits in cages at the Galleria Salita in Rome in 66, right. and the show was boycotted by animal rights activists. Yeah, of course. So, um, <laughs> But yeah, that, that combination of materials. I mean, people so people have said. I mean, I just I, this piece is being exhibited in Geneva right now, mm. and it's going to come to Italy this Saturday okay. and, and be shown here. Right. And a lot of people have have commented on the fact that it's quite sad that this fish is in such a small space. But it's a it's a beta fish, you know, where you see them in, in mm. pet shops in a bowl this big. Mm -hmm. You know, these fish. Beta so fish. it's actually you're giving him no, a sweet. But it's but it's like is 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 he more mm. is he more upset living in this space that's slightly you know larger than something the size of a teacup? You know, I it's I think so. Probably he has more space to swim in than that. Um, mm -hmm. And and you because the hydrophone is in the water, you you know in in pet stores how they always tell you not right. to tap on the glass and. You, you you see why that is now because mm -hmm. everything you tap. How does the it, microphone function? It amplifies. Yeah, you can hear. You can hear why, and you can hear footsteps coming up, and you can hear if it, oh, okay. a loud car drives by, the rumble. You mm -hmm. can hear how all these things affect mm -hmm. this small space with this living creature. Mm -hmm. Well, we were talking about the weapons. I think that that he made. And oh yes, 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 yeah. Yeah, he made these weapons from assorted materials that he put together, like a bricolor. Um, um, that's the first project he did after his premiere exhibition in Rome in January 65. Uh, so he showed these shaped canvases representing women's bodies, and they still looked more or less like paintings. And then after that, he made these fully three-dimensional weapons and coated them, all of them, in one shade of camouflage paint. Uh, but they were rejected by Plinio de Montes, his gallerist at Tataruga. And he didn't know what to do with them. And then he got a connection with John Enzo, John Enzo Speroni in Turin through Pistoletto, unveiled them there um, in January 66. I think this is really when Pascali comes into, into his own, his fully three dimensional objects. And it's in that discourse about those that he talks about childhood games a lot. Um, the childhood games that he participated in uh, when he and his friends' fathers were off at war uh, during the Second World War. Um, and he talks about uh, the activities that adults, <laughs> like the three of us, engage in on a daily basis and sort of levels all adult endeavors as games. And he says, everything we, everything we do is a game. And, um, and he talks about his work as a, as a form of play. And so with this exhibition at which he wore, uh, at the premiere he wore a full camouflage outfit and had fake grenades and a gas mask. And he dressed up. Um, yeah, cool. yeah, he uh, had, they hung a big fake missile from the ceiling and he called it Dove of Peace. Um, he photographed himself surfing the bomb. In discussing these works, which involve a pretty terrifying aggression, actually, yeah. <laughs> he talked about childhood. And, but I was saying also that, you know, Pascali was born in Bari, but he was moved about quite a bit as a child because his father was in the police force. And this sense of mobility, a sense of growing up in Polignano or Bari, um, but also moving to Rome later on and continually moving. Uh, uh, there's a sense in his work of crisis and never quite belonging to the place in which he's located. So throughout you know, his, his career and his development, there's simultaneously an evocation of something like Poolian identity, but it's also evoked in a way that involves distancing and a type of recreation. So it's not you know, Poolian identity as such. It's not that he's, since he grew up here, he can tap into this pure main line, back to Poolian culture or something like that, but rather he's been moved around a lot and when he decides in 68 uh, to start strongly evoking Puglia in some of his pieces, it's as someone who has been displaced, who has gone from, who's become an immigrant, moved to the city 
And uh, so that kind of, we were talking about that nature artifice thing has a lot to do with this transposition of rural and urban, and kind of the life of the immigrant, and that sense of the immigrant as being a part of, but at the same time, not of. Yeah. And, um, and so you get that sense with Pascal's work of it's sort of uh, things being slightly displaced um, as they're strongly evoked. You know? Duality, like multiple and things happening at the same time. Right. Sure, yeah. sure. And I guess the big question, I mean, I think when you look at something like the Bristol worms, you get nature and artifice right there side by side mm -hmm. in the object, just sitting there. It's not really a... The question is, it's a... Are, are these contradictions resolved into some kind of unity, or are they just sitting there unresolved? And that's a really complex, interesting question, mm -hmm. because the work, as a pragmatic thing, brings these oppositions together, and in that sense it is a totality. But Pascali always leaves his work incomplete to a degree. There's just, everything's partial, like with these whale's tales, you always get parts, you get fragments. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense that a proposition of some kind of totality in which oppositions fire off one another, but it's not a totalizing totality. It's a kind of self-consciously fictional and performed wholeness. And, um, and he's always moving on to something else, and it's like the object, at the very moment of fantasy, becomes pragmatically realized. It's not good enough anymore, and you move on. And he even called his works corpse after he was done with them, he's like, I'm not interested in the objects anymore. Once the process of production is complete, I'm done with them. You know? um, so there's a sense of, you know, an imaginative commitment which uh, cannot be fulfilled in the object completely, but that the objects in themselves at least deal with, they manage to set up these oppositions that really fly off on them. Vessels in a way. There's yeah. A certain amount of time. So it's not just a language game, you know, it's not just um, getting two words. Like, um, he really successfully gets them lodged in the objects. And it's, I think it's this extroversion of Pascali's that makes him extraordinary. The sensuality, that connection between the imagination and the real. But the simplicity at the same time. Yeah, yeah, the austerity. Idea. Yeah, the you know. right. Yeah. And I think, you know, after, like, with installation and digital photography and so forth, the austerity of some of the 60s work is very striking now, because mm -hmm. we've been through kind of the barrage of Matthew Barney, or, yeah. you know, we, we've been through, like, the ultra-stimulation of the five or the six or eight or whatever senses. Mm -hmm. The austerity of Pascali's work, I think, does strike a chord with the political events in the world right now, you know, the 60s also has a resonance. Yeah, it does. And, uh, um, but what do, you, what do you think of these weapons in particular? The, well, have you gotten to see any of them in person? No, not in person, no. But I mean, I, I like, it, it's, it's making a, a giant toy out of something that's very yeah. serious. Yeah, and, yeah exactly. And I, I, yeah. I really like things that are twofold. Um, right. So there is a seriousness to it, but it's 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 in mocking it, you know, yeah, in a way. Exactly. But these things kill people. But yeah. So I I find that very intriguing, and it appeals to me. And Fabio put it really well. He said um, he said Pascali was one of these people that thinks, and it's like quotation marks. He said Pascali thought he had to swim full on in order to stay afloat. So there's this sense of. Um, intensity, you know, driving the project, obviously, between January 1965 and September 1968. There are hundreds of objects produced and performances. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a, a very extended negation of the sense of there being a signature style uh, over and over again. Pascali kind of stops a project and starts another. And he compared this to a snake changing its skin. Or, um, but it, and he also has this quote where he says, uh, personalities are things that can be destroyed and reconstructed at will. 
Um, and it's precisely that thing of moving on, which is very important, not only with him, but with Boetti and other artists from the 60s. It's the previous generation, like Fontana and Bori, they sort of developed these truly resplendent, radically negative abstractions. Um, but they tended to sort of repeat them over wide stretches of time. So with Fontana, you get the zip, the, the slice in the canvas with the razor blade. And it gets to a point to where when you walk in a gallery, you see the zip and you know it's Fontana. Yeah. Um, and in the 60s with Pistoletto, his minus objects, and with Boetti and Piscali and others, uh, there's really a sense of not getting tied down to a signature gesture. And, and so with Piscali, it was just uh, a tendency to simultaneously construct and negate, and you see it in how you go thematically from one series to the next. You know, and, and, you know. This can be a complete abstraction and, and have no bearing whatsoever on anything, but it just it occurred to me, I, I just, it made me think of his background in set design and how mm -hmm. if, you, if you design a set for a show, and the show goes on, and, it, mm -hmm. and then it ends its course, and yeah, then it's break it yeah. down, and then it's yeah. something new happens, and it, it just made me think yeah. of that. Yeah. But that's interesting as well. No, that's very much the spirit. And after he made that gorgeous scene, um, Pascale went on record as saying, it's just basta con questo mare. It's just like, okay, I'm done with it. You know, it's like you create something like that, mm -hmm. and it's like, next. Yeah. yeah. This certainly is that sense. And you know, these, uh, an artist who are really attached to being a sculptor, or, yeah. you know, having, a, like something like Henry Moore, these big bronze, you know, plops one after the other. Yeah. You know? um, Pascale just definitely doesn't suffer from that kind of monumental mm -hmm. thing. And when he is monumental, it's very much like a set designer, kind of yeah. like something really big. Yeah, it's a grand. Yeah, grandiose. And in his interview with Carlo Lanzi, he compares it to wearing a yellow suit. And kind of this, his sense of being grandiose. It's, like, it's kind of like walking around wearing a shocking, a shocking yellow yeah. suit. You know? he's, like, um, he's like, I really want people to look at these objects. What I really want is to fill a space with these objects. Yeah. He says, in order to make people look at them, sometimes I make them enormous. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> when English speaking folks are, you know, run into Pascal, usually for the first time it's within an article or a catalog. Or, and, um, this was a term that Chelant came up with in September 1967. Um, but it's important to see the, the dynamism of Pascal's practice through time and to see that when he was doing it, he didn't, con you know, conceive of his work as being absolutely connected to this one label and all that it implied. But um, it's a really feverish period. Like I asked uh, Fabio Sargentini, I was like, oh, well, was Pascali aware of the term arte povera? Was he aware of Ceylon's ideas about what arte povera is? And um, was, he crit you know, was he aware of them and possibly critiquing them? And he said, oh, you know, no, not really. Like, it was just a very feverish period. Pascali didn't see himself as being an arte povera artist as such. Rather, it was, everyone was trying to innovate, to really break through. Mm -hmm. And he gave the example of Robert Smithson's Asphalt Rundown, mm -hmm. which is a pretty well-known minimalist mm -hmm. piece at this point. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, when Smithson came, Sargentini, Pascale's gallerist, also funded this project. He said, Smithson came here to Rome, we rented the truck, we got the asphalt, we went and dumped it and took the photographs, and it was only months later that, that Bob wrote to me and said, this is a major piece. I'm going to circulate the photographs and so forth. And he said, when we did it, we weren't self-consciously doing post-minimalism or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know, it was the feverish time. And, yeah. and everyone's trying to outdo one another. So the water comes, perhaps from hearing about now, and then a yes, conversation. Right, right. And then the critics do what they do with it. And, yeah. and Ante Povet is very much uh, one critical interpretation.